and uh, we're kind of closing out a whole series we've been looking at on the person of the Holy Spirit. And the person of the Holy Spirit, you know, Jesus, uh, he said, I'm leaving. And they didn't want him to leave, but he says, man, whenever I send the Holy Spirit, he's not just going to be with you, he's going to be in you. And we've taken a lot of, really, the past four or five weeks and seen everything that the Holy Spirit is. And lots of times within the church, or, or even in culture, they'll kind of label the Holy Spirit as tongues or as something, whatever it is. And it's never really been the main thing. Uh, God said that you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. That you're going to be able to resist the devil and him actually flee from you. You're going to be able to cast him out. That, that, that the Holy Spirit's going to give you knowledge that you, didn't, that you can't get from a textbook. That there's going to be times where you just know things by the Spirit of God. There's going to be times when you have wisdom that you didn't get from your mama or from anybody else. Else, but it's just there's a wisdom and a discernment with people and situations with the Holy Spirit comes he's going to tell you what to say so that you can win every case before your accuser he's going to give you power to be a witness and and he's going to give you equipping and give you calling and he's going to comfort you whenever there's times that are just devastating he's going to get down in the ditch with you and lift you out of those circumstances the Holy Spirit I'm telling you, everything Jesus did, he says, I don't do anything unless the Spirit of God tells me to do it. I don't go anywhere unless the Spirit of God leads me there. And, and Jesus was a carpenter, the Son of God, no doubt. But, but uh, the day that the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove, and a voice came from heaven and said, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. The Bible says from that moment on, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, and there he whipped the devil, that the devil tried to get him uh, to eat some things he was not supposed to eat. How many of y'all know this played out with the first Adam? The first Adam was tempted to eat some things he was not supposed to eat. How many of y'all know he didn't pass that test? How many of y'all know our Jesus passed that test? First temptation was, hey, eat this. He says, I'm not eating that. Then he says, bow down. He says, I'm not bow down. He says, go ahead and jump off of this. And some angels, he said, no, I'm not going to test God. And, and from that moment on, he was not just the son of a carpenter. That baby was Jesus, Messiah, anointed one, Yeshua. And, and even John the Baptist, he said, man, are you really the one? He said, man, the lame walk, the blind see, the dead are raised. Like, man, we are just getting started, baby. So uh, Jesus has turned the whole world upside down with the Holy Spirit. And then on the day of Pentecost, how many of y'all glad Jesus is not selfish? No, no, he didn't keep it for him. He says, no, 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 John baptized with water, but I'm going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. On the day of Pentecost, he poured out the Holy Spirit upon all flesh. And he said, this is not just a man thing. It's for men and women. It's not just for old seasons old seasoned saints no he said no thou pour it out on your young men and your young women on your boys on your girls on your teenagers come on I know some powerful teenagers come on, I know some powerful young people that are that are used by the spirit of God mightily in the earth how many of y'all want to sign up for that program well, you can. Come on, you have. You say, hey, Holy Spirit. So I've encouraged you to, to, to wake up and say, let's go, Holy Ghost. Let's go. Let's go. Let's, let's go do your work today. But I want to kind of close out and look at this and really specifically feel like this is the direction the Lord wants me to go. Hello, Ansley. Uh, to, 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 to look at the name of who he is. Now, we have God the Father. We have God the Son. And we have who? Everybody say Holy. Holy. And I want to look at the holy side of the Holy Spirit because his name is unique to the others. His name's not Jesus. His name is not God the Father. But he is called the Holy Spirit. And whenever it comes to talking about holiness or the Lord wanting you to walk or grow in holiness and crucify your flesh, there's usually not a lot of tambourines happening in the sanctuary, a lot of, not a lot of people running around high-fiving like, yes. No, a lot of times whenever you talk about these things, people feel like that this is Christianity trying to uh, keep you from doing certain things. I did not want to serve the Lord for many years because I thought he was going to make me do things I didn't want to do. I, re I felt like for some reason that the Lord was going to send me to Russia to be a missionary, and it's cold, y'all. It's like, I ain't going over there, and I don't speak Russian, and the big furry hats and, you know, the women, it's like, that's just not my style, you know. It's like my American wife is so beautiful. And, you know, so, I know, sorry, Ansley, was that bad? I shouldn't have said that. 
keep going. So, but I just felt like the Lord was going to make me go over there, marry somebody I didn't want to marry, be with people I didn't want to be, you know, speak a language, be in this cold place. And finally, after I, I came to a place where I submitted my life to the Lord, I said, Lord, all right, Lord, I'll go to Russia. And the Lord so clear said, I never wanted you to go to Russia. I said, dang it. <laughs> but he said, but I wanted you to be willing to go to Russia. And once I got to that place where I said, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do, then the Lord really opened things up for me and opened up a promised land to me. And what I want you to see about the Old Testament is that God gave them the Ten Commandments. He said, thou shalt not do this and thou shalt not do that. You can't do this and you can't do that. And it seemed like he was putting all these restrictions. And sometimes in Christianity, we really highlight the restrictions. But how many of y'all know it was never really about the restrictions? It was always about the promise. Land. It was always about the promised land. It was always about, God said, I have something for you that's beyond your wildest dreams. I have vineyards you didn't plant. I got houses you didn't build. I got fruit the size of things that's unimaginable to you. Like there is a land that flows with milk and honey. And if you'll listen to me, I can bring you into the promised land. Now, we get mixed up with the rules and the can't do this and we can't do that. And that's where we get stuck in the wilderness. And we just wander around in this wilderness going round and round thinking about all the things that you can't do. But it was never been about that. It was God says, I've got a place for you. Like, I've got things for you that are beyond what you could ever think, hope, or imagine. And if you'll listen to me, I'll show you how to get there. It, but, but there's always your flesh or that part of you that for some reason wants to go back to Egypt. And if you look in the Old Testament, God raised up a man named Moses. And Moses represented the law because he had the Ten Commandments. God gave him the Ten Commandments. He said, you tell my people to keep these commandments. How many of y'all know they did not do a good job? And, 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 and you, you can't get there by trying to keep the law. And that's why God told Moses, he says, Moses, you're not going to be able to bring the people into the promised land. You're not going to be able to get there because you're not going to get where God wants you to get just by trying to keep a bunch of rules. God had to raise up somebody else. He had to raise up a Yeshua. And he told Joshua, which Joshua is, is just the English uh, word uh, for Yeshua. He said, I, I, you, the, my people can't get there by keeping the law. So I'm going to have to raise up a Yeshua that will bring them into the promised land. And all of this points to in the New Testament. The New Testament, how many of y'all know we don't get there? We just read. We don't get there by trying to keep a bunch of, of, of rules and laws because you can't keep them in your own might, in your own strength. But God sent a Yeshua. God sent another deliverer named Joshua to cross you over into the promised land. And what I want you to see is we're going to have baptism today. And if you've never been baptized, you should be baptized. Because in the Old Testament, God sent Moses to Pharaoh. And he said, Pharaoh, you need to let those people go. And Pharaoh said, I will never let them go. They were bound. They're going to stay bound. And they'll always be bound. I'm keeping them. They are mine. How many of y'all know God's relentless when he comes to his kids? When it comes to his kids... You know, I've totaled three cars in my life. I don't say that proudly. I'm not bragging. It's not like I was, you know, trying to win some, some spectacular racing circuit. No, I just totaled them out on the road. And the, the first one that I totaled, it's just a miracle. It's a miracle of God. I fell asleep at the wheel at probably 2 a.m., 2 or 3 in the morning. I don't know. I'd been out with my friends. There was a car parked on the side of the road. I don't know how fast I was going. I was going so fast, though, in order to get the license plate from the car that I hit, the, the officer had to use a probar to get that license plate out of my engine. So I don't know how fast I was going. My head went through the windshield and had to have plastic surgery. That's why I looked nice before, before that. It was... <laughs> <laughs> uh, last time I told this story I said I used to be black and Ansley got so mad at me <laughs> because she was like you can't say that uh, so uh, oops I did it again uh, so anyway I, uh, the, 
the officer, lots of stories, you know, lots of events happened, but, but by the grace of God, that was, that was the first one, and I'd like to say that was the only one, but I did it a couple more times, just uh, dealing with my flesh, and there was something in me that knew that God wanted to use me. I didn't want to do it, so uh, again, I thought he was trying to get me a bunch of, to do a bunch of stuff I didn't want to do, when all along, God had this promised land for me. But back to the Old Testament, God told Pharaoh, he says, you need to let these people go. And Pharaoh said, I'll never let them go. And, and Moses came back to him again and said, God said that if you don't let them go, there's going to be some bad things happen. He says, I'll never let them go. You all know the story. He comes back again. I'll never let him go. And then he actually says, I'm going to make it worse. And that's, I've seen this many times, people that will make a decision to start following the Lord and things actually get worse instead of get better. Because Pharaoh told Moses, he says, we're going to take away all their straw and they're going to have to make the same amount of bricks, but now they can't use straw. And the Bible says that they beat them mercilessly, that they're taskmasters. They, they, were, uh, they had no mercy towards them. But y'all know God, God don't give up, baby. He just kept sending Moses until finally the enemy said, you have to go. And not only did, they, did he let them go, the Bible says that they gave all their silver and gold to God's people as they were leaving. And now they're being chased, but I want you to see this verse because this is, this is the part where that, that you're going to struggle with and that we all struggle with. And this is... Exodus chapter 14, verse number 5, it says, When the word reached the king of Egypt that the Israelites had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds. What have we done letting the Israelite slaves get away, they ask. Verse number 9 says, And the Egyptians chased after them with all the forces of Pharaoh's army. And what I want you to know is for the rest of your life, the enemy wants you back. The enemy is always going to be pursuing you. He wants you back. That you're never going to have a day that the enemy is not going to want you back. And you're going to make a decision to serve the Lord, to follow the Lord with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. But the enemy wants you back. And you feel, you've sensed and you felt that tug. You felt that I want to do right, but there's, there's a war that rages within me. And God's people could not get there with the law. They needed a Yeshua. They needed God to raise up a Joshua. But you all know the story that the enemy begins to chase and begins to pursue God's people until they get to the Red Sea. And that's what, this is why baptism is so important because if you look in Hebrews chapter, uh, Hebrew, Hebrews 11, or let's just do Exodus chapter 16 verse 3 first, Exodus 16, 3. I'm sorry, I lied again. I want to do Hebrews first. They're all so good, I can't, can't make up my mind. It's like, man, I got, they're all wonderful. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 29, it says, faith opened the way. For the Hebrews to cross the Red Sea as if on dry ground. But when the Egyptians tried to cross, they were swallowed up and drowned. And I want you to see this is the Old Testament picture of baptism. That the enemy does not want to let you go. But he can't keep you. Because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And the first baptism we have in scripture are these boys walking across on dry ground. But there was something that was left in that water. And that's why baptism is so powerful because there will be people that will climb in that tub outside in a few minutes. And things that have been chasing them for years will be drowned. That there will be a watery grave for things that have been chasing them and pursuing them for years. And that they will get out of that water raised to newness of life. There is so much power in baptism. It is not just a tenet of the church. It is not just... Something that we take lightly. If you've never been baptized, Jesus said, be he baptized. Because he knows that the enemy has been after you and he's chased you. And even though he let you go, he wants you back. But he'll, the, the, the Lord, the spirit of the Lord brought them to the Red Sea. And they said, well, what do we do next? And he said, put out your staff over that. And when the water parted, they went across. And then whenever the Egyptians tried to come, they were swallowed up. 
And I believe that there'll be people that'll walk out there uh, in, in a few minutes and get baptized, and there's gonna be some things that are swallowed up. But how many of y'all know, even after baptism, there's still something within humanity that wants to be that wants to go back into bondage. Because even after they came through the Red Sea, almost within within weeks. They started a yearning in them to want to go back and be enslaved to the system that God brought them out of. How many of y'all know we're weird people? Why be faithful to the unfaithful? And then, how many of y'all know God is faithful and yet for some reason we'll be unfaithful to him and we'll be faithful To the pharaohs of this world who have proven to let you down time and time again. And I don't know why. It's just within all of us. It's in preachers too, y'all. It's in everybody. But what I want to show you here in a minute, that the power of the Holy Spirit, God sent the Holy Spirit to help. That God's going to give them in the New Testament what they didn't have in the Old Testament. And if you look in Hebrews chapter 16, I mean Exodus chapter 16, verse number 3. They've come through their baptism experience. Their enemy has been swallowed up in a watery grave. The thing that had bound them and pursued them for all those years, God had swallowed up. And yet they say this, it says, if only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt, they moaned. There we sat around pots filled with meat. And we ate all the bread we wanted. Well, that's the problem right there. It's those carbs. <laughs> dang, dang carbs. They're so enticing. They're so, they're so enticing. It's like they just keep bringing those buttery rolls at the Logan's house. They just, so man, we had all the bread we wanted. But now you brought us out in, in, the, in this wilderness to starve us all to death. How many of y'all know they hardly starved? God rained down supernatural bread from heaven. He brought in quail supernaturally. Water came out of rocks that they didn't have to dig that well. It just flowed out. And yet in their mind, it was like, well, I know we have this, but think about what we had back there. What you had back there was a bondage, was a slave master that was beating you and that was making you build his kingdom and you didn't have a land of your own. And what God was bringing them to was a promised land. So, so what I want you to see this, this morning is that the Holy Spirit, he wants to help in this because this is all Old Testament. But even in the Old Testament, there were people, and, and I, I want to show you three of them. And I told you we're going to read a bunch of verses. So I'll read some of these kind of fast. Genesis chapter 17, verse number 1. It says, when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. And here's the result. He says, I'm going to make a covenant with you by which I will guarantee to give you countless descendants. And at this, Abram fell at his face on the ground. And God said to him, this is my covenant with you. I'll make you the father of a multitude of nations. What's more is I'm going to change your name. It'll no longer be Abram. Instead, you'll be called Abraham, for you'll be called the father of many nations. God found in Abraham somebody, even in the Old Testament, that had purposed to live a blameless life. Daniel chapter 6, verse number 3, y'all know the story of Daniel. Daniel became a political slave in bondage in Babylon. The Bible says that he prayed three times a day. He would open the windows and he would kneel. He would kneel at breakfast, he would kneel at lunch, and he would kneel at dinner. And God elevated him, and he elevated him to such a place that he got a bunch of enemies. And it says in in verse 3, it says, Daniel proved himself more capable than all the other administrators and high officers. Because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. The other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs. But they could not find anything to criticize or condemn about him. 
He was faithful. He was always responsible. And he was completely trustworthy. And I mean, I know there was a reward. There was a promised land on the other side of his faithfulness that other people didn't have. There was once a man named Job who lived in the land of Uz. I love this one. Job chapter 1, verse 1. He was blameless. Everybody say blameless. He was a man of complete integrity. This was the definition of integrity that they give. He feared God and he stayed away from evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep. 3,000 camels, 500 teams of oxen. Most families lived and died and never owned one oxen. He had 500 teams of them. He had 500 female donkeys. I don't know why you'd want 500 female donkeys, but that's besides the point, I guess. He had many servants. He was, in fact, the richest person in that entire area. How many of you know God don't mind you being the richest person? In the entire area. Job's sons would take turns preparing feasts in their homes. And they would invite their three sisters. How many of y'all know that's a miracle right there? <laughs> <It's just like laughs> Maybe your sister wasn't like my sister. She was Satan spawn. Uh, just kidding. She's probably watching. Love you. Love you, sis. We fought. How many of y'all fought with your siblings? I just fought with mine. We fought. But they would all get together. I love this. Job's kids like being around him. Probably didn't hurt how rich he was. <laughs> Y'all know free Kushan delay never hurt anybody. <laughs> go over and have some free lamb, a leg of lamb. They would all get together. Watch this. But when the celebration ended, sometimes after several days, Job would purify his children. Love this. He'd get up early in the morning. He would offer a burnt offering for each of them. And he said to himself, perhaps my children have sinned, cursed God in their hearts. What an example. Maybe my kids screwed up this week. I'm going to give an offering to God just on behalf of my kids. Just bringing my kids up before, before the Lord. This was Job's regular practice. One day the members of the heavenly court, they came to present themselves before the Lord. The accuser, Satan, came to them. So said, where have you come from? The Lord asked Satan. Satan answered the Lord and he says, I've been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. And the Lord asked Satan, he says, have you noticed my servant Job? Watch this. He's the finest man in all the earth. Even without the Holy Spirit, he made choices that positioned him to where God of heaven said, Job is exceptional. In the way he carries himself, the way he takes care of his family, the way he takes care of his business. He does it with complete integrity and he's totally blameless. He's blameless. He's a man of complete integrity. This is the definition again. He fears God. He stays away from evil. And Satan replied to the Lord, Yeah, but Job has good reason to fear God. You've always, watch this, put a wall of protection around him. I mean, I know it may cost you to serve God, but it'll also pay. But he'll put a wall of protection around you, even in the Old Testament. And he says, his home and his property, you've made him prosper in everything he does. Look how rich he is. But if you reach out and take away everything he has, he will surely curse you to your face. All right, you may test him, the Lord said to Satan. Do whatever you want with everything he possesses, but don't harm him physically. So Satan left the Lord's presence. If you read the rest of the book of Job, you see how all of this unfolded. He lost everything. He had boils all over his skin, lost his whole family. Then in the end, he stuck with God, and God gave him double back. What I want you to see, and the reason I'm reading these, is we're talking about the Holy Spirit. 
And again, I know whenever you talk about the Holy Spirit, we like talking about the, the power and the comfort and the, the discerning aspects and word of wisdom, word of knowledge and prophecy and all these things. But he's called holy for a reason. And he wants to, he wants to show you. I have a friend named Joel Sims at Pastors in Jackson. And I like he always says to grow your no. That you have to learn how to grow your no or to exercise that part of in you when your body says yes You've grown your no that says, they may, but I won't. They will, but I won't. That there's certain things that I won't do because I don't want to compromise the Holy Spirit and, and, and mess up where God is bringing me to. Because it's not just about what you can't do. It's about where God's trying to bring you. And God wants to bring you into this land, this place, this thing that's flowing with milk and honey. But there's something always within you that's getting pulled back to Egypt. There's always this enemy that's pursuing you that wants you back. And you, and, and you have to fight. And, and I'll show you some scriptures that even in the New Testament, there's a war going on the inside of you. How many of y'all have experienced this war before? How many of y'all y'all felt and experienced this pull to just kind of go do what everybody else is doing? How many of y'all know Dave, uh, Daniel felt that pull, that he was pulled? He said, hey, you need to eat what everybody else is eating. He said, I will not. He said, hey, when the music plays, you need to dance like everybody else. He said, I will not. Hey, when the music plays, you need to bow down and worship. He said, I will not. You throw me in a fiery furnace, you'll throw me in the lion's den. I don't care where you throw me, I will not bow down. How many of y'all know that was a choice that he had to make and God God honored that choice. So what I want you to see is in the New Testament, we have the same choices that they have, but we have the Holy Spirit to help us. That on the inside, there is a Spirit of God that will help you and actually strengthen you and equip you so that you can overcome and, and, and get brought into the place that God has for you. And this is in Romans chapter 7, verse number 15. Y'all are going to relate to this. Everybody smile. Whenever I teach this message, sometimes people don't smile as much. Does this mean I can't go karaoke? Does this mean, does this mean I can't karaoke? <laughs> Listen, I'm going to have fun no matter what. <laughs> he says, I am a mystery to myself for what I want to do. Or he says, for I want to do what's right, but I end up doing what my moral instincts condemn. Everybody say amen. amen. Yeah, this is your chance to amen. <laughs> this is your chance. He says, if my behavior is not in line with my desire, my conscience still confirms the excellence of the law. And now I realize that it's no longer my true self doing it, but the unwelcome intruder of sin in my humanity. How many of y'all have experienced the unwelcome intruder of sin into your humanity? The longings to do what is right are within me, but willpower is not enough to accomplish it. My lofty desires to do what is good are dashed when I do the things I want to avoid. So if my behavior contradicts my desires to do good, I must conclude that it's not my true identity doing it, but the unwelcome intruder of sin hindering me from being who I really am. I mean, I know God knows who you really are. And again, he's trying to bring you into this place, and he wants to help you. He doesn't want to leave you wandering in the wilderness of sin. No, no, no. Even after baptism, he wants to help you not get brought back into bondage that he brought you out of. He says, though my experience of this principle, through my experience of this principle, I discovered that even when I want to do good, evil is ready to sabotage me. Even when I want to do good, evil is ready to sabotage me. Truly, deep within my true identity, I love to do what pleases God. And I believe every person in here could say that. Say, I want to please God. I love to please God. But how many of y'all felt this pull before? Yes. Aren't you glad we're talking about this? Thanks, John. Amen. 
I love to do what pleases God, but I discern another power operating in my humanity. And it's waging a war against the moral principles of my conscience and bringing me into captivity as a prisoner of the law of sin. This unwelcome intruder in my humanity. What an agonizing situation I'm in. So who has the power to rescue this miserable man from the unwelcome intruder of sin and death? I give all thanks to God for his mighty power has finally provided a way out through our Lord Jesus, the anointed one. So if left to myself, the flesh is aligned with the law of sin. But now my renewed mind is fixed on and submitted to God's righteous principles. Everybody say renewed mind. It's really where I want to kind of end, where I, where I want to finish up. I'm going to read a couple more passages. But what I want you to see is that you have to renew your mind, not to just the things that you think that the Lord doesn't want you to do. And renew your mind into what he's wanting to bring you into. Because in the, in the Old Testament, if they could have kept their eye on the promise and not on the problem, they would have made it through a lot quicker. But they would moan and complain and say, oh, man, we used to have melons and leeks, and we used to have this, and we used to have that. And God was trying to get them. That's why they sent spies into the land to go see, hey, you need to go see what God is trying to bring you into. And, and they sent 12 spies in, and y'all know the story. Ten of them said, man, we can't get into that. There's giants in the land. But two of them came back. Joshua and Caleb said, man, it's a good land. It's flowing with milk and honey, and, man, there's giant fruit. Like, we are more than it. They said, let us go up at once and take over this land. If God is with us, it doesn't matter who's against us. Let's go into the land. But I mean, y'all know there's some giants that you have to fight. Uh, this is Romans chapter 12, verse number 1. You're going to say it a whole other way. I told you I'm going to give you a lot of verses today. As we close out the Holy Spirit. Grow your no. You all know if Daniel can do it, you can too. If Abraham can do it, you can too. If Job did it, you can too. They did it without all of the, the, the things that we have. They didn't have Jesus living in them. Do you not know that your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit? I mean, you got the Holy Spirit living in you. I mean, y'all know our, our no should be a little stronger than the Old Testament. Our no should be a little bit that, that we should have a little bit more on the inside that says, no, no, no. I want to I wanna do the will of God for my life. I'm about to send my oldest man child away, Noble Burns. He's I got about a month left with him, and he's going off to college for the next four years. And 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 not to brag on him, but to brag on him. And uh, you know, as a preacher's kid, I always use my kids in illustrations. And then I hear about it the following week, like, why would you tell him I did that? And it's like, baby, you're all I got. <laughs> like, like, I don't have any other kids. It's just you, baby. It's just you. But in this instance, you know, uh, I will say Noble, as a young man, made a lot of choices I never asked him to make. I never had conversations. I think sometimes people think that, that I, I have these real strict boundaries for my kids. Actually, uh, I've tried to lead my kids, uh, show them that God has something extravagant for them. And if they'll just follow him, then he'll lead them. He'll get them there. So, you know, Noble, at, at one point, he was all big into Xbox, and he's Xboxing like 10 hours a day, like a lot of kids do. And then all of a sudden, he stopped playing Xbox. And I'm like, why, why aren't you playing Xbox? Y'all were Haloing and all of these other ones, I don't know, Modern Warfare. And, you know, how many of y'all know the video games these days have gotten pretty extravagant? I mean, they're like watching a movie and all this. And, 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 but there came a point to where he said, uh, I don't want to play it anymore. And I was like, well, why don't you want to play anymore? He's like, well, I don't want to play. For, it's not good for me. And it introduces me. There's other people in the chats, and there's things going on I didn't even know about. But kudos to him that he threw it in the garbage and never picked it back up again. I didn't make him do that. He, he made a choice. It just said, you know, that there's something in there that's drawing me to the flesh and not to the spirit. So I'm going to crucify the flesh is what the Bible says crucify the flesh. How many of y'all know crucifixion is a painful death sometimes? All the time. How many of y'all know crucifixion is a slow death? 
that it's not something that happens overnight. And, and then, you know, a couple years later, we're rocking along, didn't really think a whole lot about it. Then I tried to show him some stuff on social media. And he said, I deleted all my social media. And this has been now probably three or four years ago. He has not been on any social media the past few years. And I, I'm like, well, I want to send this to you. It's funny. <laughs> like, I want to I show this to you. I'm not on social media anymore. Why aren't you on social media? Well, there's things on there that I didn't want, didn't need to participate in. So I got rid of it. He made the choice to mortify, to crucify that area of the life, of his life. Because there's things that are either leading you to the promised land or they're keeping you in the wilderness. There's things that are leading you to the milk and honey or they're keeping you enslaved and in bondage. God wrote a whole book in your Bible called Hosea, which literally means salvation. That's what it means. And he told Hosea, he said, Hosea, I want you to marry a prostitute who will never be faithful to you. And I always want you pursuing her and taking her back. Because even though she's unfaithful, you'll demonstrate my faithfulness to my people. And how many of y'all know many times we're unfaithful to God, but we don't have to be. We're unfaithful to God, but we don't have to be. That we can make the choice to mortify or to kill, to, to, to murder things that are keeping us bound and enslaved. And that the, the, the person that will help you do that is called the Holy Spirit. Because to live an unholy life is to live a life without the help of the Holy Spirit. So for us to talk about all the wonderful things that the Holy Spirit is and we choose to live an unholy life makes it very difficult for the Holy Spirit because he doesn't want to be around that. So even though we've been freed from the law, how many of y'all glad that you're free from the law? We're free from the law and yet we still have the responsibility, we still have the responsibility to listen to the Holy Spirit and recognize the Holy Spirit's not just trying to keep me from doing certain things. He's trying to get me to a certain place. And if I don't focus on the things, I focus on the place. Then I can come through that baptism and my enemies can be swallowed up. But I can actually go on from that place, go through that wilderness and cross over with Yeshua into the promised land and cross over into that place that God has for me. Romans chapter 12, verse number one. Two more passages and then we're gonna, I'm going to let you go. How many of y'all doing okay out there? So somebody said, what did you talk about at church today? You say, the Holy Spirit and he's helping me not to be bound. But he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And he's bringing me to a promised land. Romans chapter 12, verse number 1. Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you, give your bodies to God. Give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let them be a living and a holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. How many of y'all know in the Old Testament when he found something acceptable, he blessed their socks off? How many of y'all know sometimes we want the Lord to bless our socks off, but we want to live the way that we want to live? And the Lord said, hey, that's not, that's not right. Learn how to grow your no. Learn how to grow your no. It's not going to maybe happen overnight, but how many of y'all believe we could get better at this? How many of y'all believe we could get better at self-control? How many of y'all believe that we could control our, better, our, our temper better this year than maybe last year? How many of y'all think we could get better controlling our appetites this year than maybe last year? How many of y'all, how many of y'all think maybe we could put some filters on our, on our internet so that we don't wind up at the same sites 10 years from now that we're wound up on now? How many of y'all think the Lord, the Holy Spirit will help us grow our no and come out of some of these things and move us into a place of integrity and blameless life? I got a few amens. That's good. 
I plead with you, give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let them be a living, holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Second time he said this, renew your mind. Then you'll learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, perfect. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you're better than you really are. I'm just reading y'all. I'm just a reporter. This just in. Don't think you're better than you are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves. I mean, I think that's a good place to start. Just be honest where you are. Say, Lord, I struggle with this. Lord, I'm, Lord I've never allowed you to do this surgery on my life. Lord, I want to get better at this. Be honest with your evaluation of yourself. Measure yourselves by the faith God has given each of us. Just as our bodies have many parts, each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We're many parts of one body, and we all have a special function. So it, we're many parts of the body. We all belong to each other. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. If God's given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God's given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. Everybody say well. Just do, do the best you can. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it's giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Here's a good list that we look at. Holy Spirit, help us with this. Hate what is wrong hold tightly to what is good love each other with genuine affection take delight in honoring each other never be lazy but work hard serve the Lord enthusiastically rejoice in our confident hope be patient in trouble and keep on praying when God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. I mean, I know that's a hard prayer. Bless them. But don't bless them out. Just bless them. There's a difference. Be happy when those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. Don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all you can to live in peace with everyone. Everybody say amen. amen. How many of y'all know we got work to do? How many y'all thank God the Holy Spirit will help us? I love this thought. The disciples always called themselves disciples. They never called themselves Christians. If you ask Peter, he said, Peter, who are you? He said, I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. Say, so who's James? I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. The disciples never called themselves Christians. They always called themselves disciples. It was the world that labeled them Christians. What's that mean? That means we really don't have the right to label ourselves a Christian. The world should look at us and label us Christians. That the world should see that we're different, that we act different, that we talk different. And then they'll say, that's a Christian right there. I can see it. I can hear it. We're just disciples of Jesus. But how many of y'all believe the world should look at us and label us a Christian? And in the book of Acts, you don't see them saying, we're Christian, we're Christian, we're Christian. They said, no, we're just disciples of Jesus. But people took notice of the way that they lived and labeled them and said, 
That's a Christ follower. That one right there has been with Jesus. That one's been with Jesus. Now, I mean, I know the spirit is willing, but the flesh is what? Everybody say weak. That your spirit wants to do all these things, but it's your flesh that you have problems with. But I believe you can get better at it. And I believe that as you will and you focus on where he's bringing you to, not just what you think you can't have. For me, years and years went by and I thought, man, I don't want to do what the Lord's called me to do. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. Because he's going to make me do a bunch of stuff I don't want to do. I mean, I know it was never about the law. It was always about the promised land. And the only thing I could focus on was the law. Well, I'm not going to get to do this, and I'm not going to get to do that, and I'm not going to get to do this. But it was never about that with God. It was always, Kevin Burns, I'm trying to bring you into something you hadn't even thought of or imagined yet. And if you'll listen to me, I can get you into a promised land that will be better than you thought was possible. And he's done that. The Lord's been so so good and so generous and so, so gracious to me. Let me all know it's not because I'm a preacher. It has nothing to do with being a preacher. It has to do with the same choices that you have to make. Man, I struggle with these. These are things I'm not good at. I'll tell you, I struggle just like you struggle. My flesh, it screams at times. My flesh, it screams just like your flesh screams. I love ice cream all the time. Chunky ice cream. With The more chunks, the better. Ansley caught me yesterday getting ice cream out of there. She says, what are you doing? And I was like, I want a snack. <laughs> I, want a, I, want a, I want a snack. Listen, I have the same flesh that you have. I have the same social media that you have. I have a computer just like you have. I hate people driving in the left lane when they have no business. Probably they don't even need a driver's license. They probably just need to go to a retirement home. Like they shouldn't even be driving, in my opinion, much less being in the left lane. Like I have the same exact flesh that you have. Mine's not sanctified flesh. Mine's not preacher flesh. I have the same exact one. I love fried fish, Tammy. Like, I love, me and Tammy, we both love fried fish with tartar sauce. Like, come on, somebody. Like, my flesh wars in me just like it wars in you. But God has a promised land for me and a promised land for you. Hey, allow the Holy Spirit not just to make you smart and make you give you comfort whenever somebody you love dies. No, no, no. Allow the Holy Spirit to do a work in you, grow your no, so that you can come out and be a Daniel in your generation and be an Abraham in your, in your generation, be a Job in your generation, be somebody in your generation that when the world looks at it, it says, that's a Christian, not, hmm, not quite sure. Say, that person has been with Jesus. That person has been with Jesus. Let me pray for you. God, we thank you for your help, the help of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you lead us into baptism to swallow up our enemies. God, we recognize that Pharaoh wants us back. That Pharaoh wants us back. Come on, and God's been trying to bring some of you into a place for, for years but there's areas of your life that are kind of unsubmitted to the lordship of Jesus Christ. And it's kept you wandering in this wilderness. It's kept you in this pattern of going round and round and round. God's wanting to bring you into a new place in your relationship with him, a relationship with others, a new peace that maybe you haven't had before. Thank you for the help of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're here in the earth to help us do in the New Testament what they could never do in the Old Testament. That the Old Testament, all they had was the law. They were bound to the law, and the law couldn't get them to the promised land. You raised up Yeshua. You raised up another deliverer so that they could cross over. God, I thank you for every person here under the sound of my voice. God, that you have something so, so wonderful for them, that you have a peace that passes understanding, that you have a plan for them that's even better than they could hope, think, or imagine. But there's parts of our life that we have to crucify in order for us to cross over, that we'll have to crucify, and it'll be painful. There'll be certain relationships 
you'll have to cut off, you'll have to crucify that relationship. Certain things that you've been hanging on to, he says, hey, if you'll crucify that thing, you can cross over into something else. And it's going to hurt. There's certain areas, I can tell you, over my life, over the years, the Lord's had me fast and do certain things to grow my no. He said, hey, you need to start practicing fasting so that you can grow your self-control. Not trying to keep something from you. I'm trying to reveal something to you. True riches. True riches. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You have true riches for every person here. So much better. So much better. God, that we put our eyes on the promised land. We put our eyes on the promised land, on what's out in front of us. Five years out in front of you, God's got some things he's working on that he wants you to step over into. Ten years out in front of you, God's got some things he's working on that he wants you to step over into those things and not be stuck wandering. Come on, just purpose in your heart. Just say, Lord, teach me, show me how to mortify, how to crucify, how to kill this thing that's been hindering me. I don't want to be loyal to that that causes regret in my life. That our flesh always causes regret. God, I don't want to be loyal to those things that make me regret. God, I want to be loyal to you. I want to follow you. If you're here, you need prayer today for anything. If you're far from the Lord, if you're not saved, you've never been born again. Maybe you're here and you just know, man, there's just a couple of areas that the Lord has been dealing with you and that is dealing with you on. And you just say, Lord, strengthen me, quicken me in my inner man. I recognize the Holy Spirit is there to help me cross over in this area. And I've been trying to do it with the law and just by keeping rules and regulations. But I need the Spirit, the life-giving Holy Spirit to help me cross over in this area. If you're here and you need prayer for anything, I'd love to pray with you and pray for you. I'm not trying to embarrass you. I don't want to call you out, but I don't want to close without giving you an opportunity. If you're here and you say, hey, I'm not, far, I'm not, I'm not close to the Lord. I'm far from God. If you're here and you need prayer. You just sense that there's things that the Lord's trying to bring you into. But you're like Jacob. You're just wrestling. And God's wanting to bless you. He's wanting to move you over. If that's you, I'm asking you to raise your hand right where you are. I'm not going to. Yes, man. Anybody else? You say, hey, yep, 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 yep. God, we thank you for your help. Supernatural help of the Holy Spirit. Not by might. Not by power. But by the Holy Spirit. If you, if you raise your hand, I'm asking you to stand right where you are. Just stand up right where you are. Nobody looking around. It's between you and the Lord. I'm not going to bring you down here to the front. I feel like, come on, whenever we stand, our roots go down. That whenever we stand up, roots of stability go down. God, we thank you for supernatural strength. May the Lord strengthen you, quicken you in your inner man. That you're strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Thank you, Lord, for supernatural help and deliverance. And, God, I pray for fresh vision, fresh vision of what you have for them, fresh vision for a promised land, a brighter day, fresh vision for freedom and newness of life, fresh vision for new provision. The Lord bring new provision to you as you walk blameless before him. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord strengthen you. God, we thank you for supernatural help by the Holy Spirit. Everybody in here, stand up on your feet. Thank God for his goodness. We have grow class that's about to start in here. I probably went over again. You're going to be mad at me, but that's okay. Sorry, Eric, wherever you are. I keep getting into his time. If you need prayer for anything else, I'm asking you to come down here to the front. We have altar workers that love to pray with you and pray for you. Let's make a confession of faith. Everybody say, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. is my friend. The Holy Spirit is teaching me integrity, blameless, faith-filled life.
towards the kingdom of heaven. I thank you, Lord, for leading me to green pastures, still waters. I'm crossing over, not going back to the promised land you have for me. Help me give my body as a living sacrifice to you. Holy, blameless, acceptable, and blessed by you. In Jesus' name. We bless you before you go. God, we thank you. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord's face shine on you and give you peace supernaturally this week. In Jesus' name, everybody says, amen, 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 amen. amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.